you paid with hands that bled All for love in everything Once for all It is finished Once for all He is alive
Hello and welcome to In Touch. My name's Sam and I'm the minister at Melton Mowbray Baptist Church. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you are so welcome. Well, I'll tell you what, last Sunday didn't we have a wonderful day. I started my Easter Sunday celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ at 6am in our back car park with 30 other people from Melton Mowbray Baptist Church, praising God, offering prayers of thanksgiving and reading about the good news that took place over 2,000 years ago on Easter Sunday, or just after 2,000 years ago on Easter Sunday. I then went home and uh, I, I, I was in charge of the bacon sandwiches. Then we sat down to watch In Touch together and what a uplifting service that was. Thank you to everyone who was involved in our online offering last week. Wasn't it wonderful? Then at 4 p.m. I came down here and I, I was stood on Aidan's trailer uh, and we had a praise service at 4 p.m. And it was wonderful. There were over 70 people in our car park and we could see our neighbours in Melton Fields at the back. There were kids dancing on their drives. And when we'd finished, uh, we realised that their parents had stood up and waved to us and that they'd been there and they'd heard our message. When I got home, I read on the uh, Melton Mowbray neighbourhood watch page, someone saying how wonderful it was to be out in the sunshine at 4 p.m. and hear the strains of thine be the glory wafting over them in the glorious summer sun. I want to give God the glory for all that went on last Sunday. I mean, it, isn't it amazing that a week before we were told that there was going to be Arctic wings, winds, potentially Arctic showers, but obviously the prayers of every church, I think, in the UK uh, meant that we were heard and praise God he gave us a glorious sunny day and we were able to be together. I hope that you felt something of the hope, the joy and the revolution of Resurrection Sunday last week and I pray that it empowers you as you continue through this springtime and as we prepare to be transformed and brought back to life uh, as COVID restrictions cease to have such a big impact on us. This Monday coming up, we have got some, uh, some changes once again. We can go to non-essential shops, uh, which is really good for me because I need some new clothes. Also brilliant, I get to go to the barbers. Going to the barbers is one of my favourite things to do. I sit in that chair and I, I just switch off. Well, that's not true. I, I chat with my barber, Yusuf. Uh, we talk about our kids that are around about the same age. And then after a little while, he stops talking to me and I, I, I just am left to contemplate and think. It's a special time for me and I'm really looking forward to getting back to it along with getting back in the swimming pool. Uh, I don't know what you've got booked in for this week, but I bet you are thanking God for all that you are able to do once again. Now, uh, at the beginning of our In Touches, I often take some time to help us make ourselves present to God. And this week is no different, but rather than having us do a breathing exercise, we're going to use a song. This song is called Be Still for the Presence of the Lord, and I'm sure it's one that you'll know. This version of it takes a bit of time, so uh, I'm going to pray, and then uh, I invite you to use these words to make yourself present to God and to recognise God's presence with you. Let's pray. Loving Father God, I pray that by the power of your spirit, we would know your presence with us this morning. May we be humble enough to make ourselves present to you and allow your presence with us to transform us. As we listen and use the words of this song, may we become ever more present to you so that we are open to hear what you have to say to us today. We ask this in the powerful name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now in reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on hope 
the ground Be still for the presence of the Lord The Holy One is here
Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you and we thank you that as we read these words of David, that you have given us the path of life. We remember our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who opened the way to heaven, who opened the way for us to be your children, your sons and daughters, adopted by you. And we praise you at this Easter time for your plan of salvation. And as we come, Lord, in the power of your spirit to worship you, we praise our Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his words, his hands, his feet, my Saviour on that cursed tree.
Through Holy Week and on Easter Sunday, we've used the Gospel of John as, uh, as our route through the story. We're going to continue with that today and we're going to be looking at the story of Thomas. To tell us that story in a really child-friendly way is my friend Jude who's going to tell us that now. So Jude, thanks for doing this. It is over to you, my friend. Hello there. Have you ever been asked a question and then you've had to show some proof in your answer? Like when your parents have asked you to wash your hands before dinner and then they've asked to smell your hands to make sure you've actually washed them. Well, today we're going to read a story about a gentleman who also asked for proof and we're going to learn about what his response was and what we can learn from this story and from his response. Let's read. It had been the best and the worst of days. That morning, the disciples had found out that Jesus was alive. Mary had discovered the empty tomb first, and then Peter and John had been next. The confusion had turned to celebration, and they found out that Jesus' body had not been stolen, but that he was risen. He had battled and won over death, which meant that Jesus himself had taken the sin punishment that takes us far from God so that we wouldn't have to. He defeated death so that his children could have life. It had all been so wonderful for the disciples to realise and understand a bit more what Jesus had explained to them before he died. They were going to be able to understand more and more. But for now, the best news was true. Jesus was alive and no longer dead. That had been the best bit of the day. Then came the worst. The disciples knew that they were in danger and they feared the Jews who had killed Jesus. That morning, they were all celebrating, and in the evening, they were cowering and scared, huddled together in a room and the door was bolted. Although that's not quite true. Thomas, one of the disciples, he wasn't with them. The disciples had been quiet with restlessness, their minds reeling with the events of the day and the past few days. What would they do now? Peace be with you. A voice spoke into the silence as the disciples all gasped with wide eyes. Peace be with you. It was a voice that bubbled with light and life. They knew and loved this voice. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. As he spoke, he breathed over the disciples and it felt like sunshine filled the air. Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the room and over the disciples to bring peace and Jesus' power into their hearts. 
Later, Thomas, who hadn't been there with the disciples, now stood with them talking about all that had happened. He had been filled with wonder at what his friends had said after they saw Jesus, but he wasn't satisfied. He had missed out. He had wanted to see Jesus for himself, to hear his voice and to feel his presence. Thomas had said to his friends, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week had passed and the disciples were together and the door was locked again. The danger had not passed and they still feared the Jews. This time Thomas was with them. Once again that voice, peace be with you, rang through the air, the voice of life and light. Immediately Jesus made his way over to Thomas and stretching out his arms to, to him he said, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas was amazed ready to burst. He loved Jesus so much and he knew to what Thomas had said to the disciples a few days ago. It was as though it was a prayer being answered. He felt the presence of Jesus. He knew his love and trusted him now. My Lord and my God, he uttered. Jesus looked at Thomas with concern and love. You believe in me because you have seen me. There are many who haven't seen me like you have done. But they have chosen to believe and they are blessed. Thomas knew that this was true. He was one of the few, one of the few who would truly see Jesus for real and so Thomas's conviction turned into action as he shared the good news of Jesus. Other disciples wrote out their experiences so that as the weeks turned to months, to years and to centuries, all who have read and heard these words can choose to believe from them for themselves and be blessed. And so we saw that Thomas doubted. He wanted some proof. He wanted to be satisfied, didn't he? And he asked in a prayer that Jesus heard, although he didn't really expect it to be a prayer, he asked for more. And his response to seeing Jesus and to put it for putting his hands on his on Jesus' hands was that he was truly satisfied. His faith was made secure and he was then, with the help of the Holy Spirit, went and shared his faith with those around him. And so what about us? Well, do we doubt? Of course. Do we want to know more? We don't see Jesus for real life, do we? But we can read about him. And so it's really important that we ask the Holy Spirit to help us to really see these words and see the truth of the words in the Bible, to really believe what Jesus has said, because it really happened, it's really true, and we can really trust in him. In the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, it's in chapter 11, verse one, it says this, now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So our response, our response should be to have a secure faith. And how can we do that? We can trust in Jesus. We can trust in him that his words are true. We can trust in the stories in the Bible. We know Jesus is risen, but we want to have faith and trust in that. And when we have a secure faith, we should share it with other people. Um, there are going to be many times, and maybe have been lots of times, when you've heard other people talk about their faith, and it's made you really trust in God a little bit more. And as you grow, my prayer is that you will share your faith story with others and help them in their faith journey as well. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for loving me so much, even when I find it hard to trust in you. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me see, hear and know your love for me. Thank you for your Bible, which holds your words that we can trust in. Please help me in my faith journey to trust in you more each day and tell others about you. Amen. You're crazy.
trace And this color hidden in this place Beauty deeper than my eyes can see I can feel it coming alive in me With a little love, joy and peace Patience, kindness, changing me With a little goodness, make me whole Faithful, gentle, self-control I'm coming alive, I'm coming alive With the fruit of the Spirit inside I'm coming alive, I'm coming alive With the fruit of the Spirit inside Life is a garden the seed Every season you are all in need Growing stronger in the warmth of love And your light that's shining down from Have you ever missed out on something? Have you ever missed out on an event that your friends all experienced, but you just happened not to be there? Perhaps you were off sick the day that Prince Charles came to have a look around your school. Perhaps, perhaps you are missing from work the day the boss brought in all the treats. I remember when I was at drama school, I, I happened to be off one morning I think I was skiving uh, to go and get my, uh, an autobiography signed by Julie Walters. She was at the local Waterstones and I actually skived my tap class. And whilst I skived my tap class, I was told by my friends that Andrew Lloyd Webber and Ben Elton walked into the room, watched a bit of the tap class and went away. I couldn't believe it. In fact, I couldn't believe it so much. I was so mad that I'd missed it that I decided that I didn't believe it had happened at all. And it wasn't until a few days later, my good friend Rob uh, and I were walking down Hope Street in Liverpool and Rob shouted across the road to Ben Elton, uh, who he'd now met in a rehearsal. And Ben Elton took me and my friend Rob out for a drink. 
suddenly I believed that they had turned up in the tap class that I had missed. But because I missed it, I just couldn't quite get on board with the idea that they'd even been there. In today's reading, we hear of someone who misses out on a pivotal event in a community, in a group of friends. We are looking at the story of Thomas. The story is sometimes called Doubting Thomas. But today, I'd like to call this Proclaiming Thomas. Because it is actually Thomas who proclaims that Jesus is God. This is our reading today. Our reading is from John 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for reading that for us, Rachel. It's a famous piece of scripture. It's probably a story that you've heard before. Or maybe it's your first time coming to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas a lot. That term, that phrase has found itself lodged in our lexicon, the phrases that we use. If someone doesn't believe something that we tell them that is true, then we might refer to them as a doubting Thomas. Thomas missed a big event. Thomas missed a big event. Jesus had appeared in the locked room with the disciples in the afternoon, evening, of Easter Sunday and Thomas wasn't there. I wonder why Thomas wasn't there. Some commentators like to think that uh, he should have been there. Others come up with other reasons. There's loads of reasons why he might not have been there. The disciples had lives outside of following Jesus. Perhaps he had only had a pass to go to Jerusalem with Jesus and the others for a certain amount of time. And his family was a day's walk away. So on that Sunday, having seen his Lord and Saviour crucified, perhaps Thomas went home, checked in with his wife, saw his children. Perhaps he went to see his mum and dad. Or perhaps Thomas was the kind of person who, when they grieve, doesn't want to be surrounded by other people. Rather wants to be left alone. That might be you. Perhaps when you are grieving, all you want to do is go and walk to a desolate place without anyone by your side. I've got to admit, that isn't me. I'm pretty sure I'd have been at the heart of the gathered community because I, I just need people around me all the time. But some people 
quite rightly, don't process like that. Perhaps Thomas was out walking the streets because he did not know where to place himself after Jesus, his Lord, teacher and friend had been executed. And imagine if that was what he'd done. Imagine if he'd been walking the streets of Jerusalem and then he'd realised it was the middle of the night and he kept walking, gone through some olive groves and in the morning walked back and suddenly he's confronted with all the disciples saying, the Lord was with us. I have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question now. Do you honestly think that your first response would be, Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, okay, he must have been risen from the dead. I don't think so. Thomas's response is understandable. Thomas's response is, you've seen Jesus. I tell you what, you haven't, because I've seen him die. I know that he's dead. But you can imagine how the story kept going on. No, no, we've seen him. He was in the room. This is what happened. All the time, Thomas is hearing about this event that has transformed the character of the group that he is part of, but the group has transformed without him being there. This is quite a hurtful thing if you've ever experienced it. The group is now dealing with a new reality that you have not been part of. It's like those, I don't know if you've ever been to church, the Sunday after something big happened, like uh, people were singing in tongues or um, we'd prayed for someone and they'd healed and, and you weren't there and you come back in and you go, oh, I'm disorientated. I don't really know where I am because everyone has, in the room has been through this experience, but I've not been through it. And Thomas is going, well, I, I just can't accept it. And do you know what? It's perfectly reasonable for someone to go, I don't believe that someone's come back from the dead. I don't believe that Jesus has come back from the dead. The disciples didn't believe it. The disciples didn't believe it when Mary came back and told them that she'd seen Jesus. If they believed it, they wouldn't have been locked away in the room on Easter night. The disciples didn't accept straight away. They needed to see Jesus and Thomas is exactly the same. Although he's the one that gets tarred with the brush of being the doubting Thomas. And I can imagine the disciples going on and on about this event that he wasn't party to till eventually he spits out some venom to shut them up. Until I see him, until I see the scars in his hands, until I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. In fact, the Greek in the, in the language there is even more emphatic than that. I will never believe. That's what he says. Until I have touched these areas, I will never believe. Suddenly all the talk stops because... He's gotten so graphic, he's used words that bring a discussion to an end. A week after Easter Sunday, a week after Christ rose from the dead, the disciples are together in the same room. The door is still locked, only this time Thomas is there. Is there something in him that says... Actually, no, I should be with the gathered community. I should be with my friends. Or does he just happen to be there this time? It's amazing it happens again on the Sunday, isn't it? It's like... It's like that thing that we get with rhythms of it's the same but different. Thomas is in the room. The door is locked. And then Jesus comes amongst the disciples again. And what is his words? Shalom. Peace be with you. Jesus' presence brings about his peace and he expresses it with his words. Peace be with you. And the disciples experience peace in all its fullness. Because Jesus is alive and he is with them. And Thomas is confronted by the man 
who he did not believe had rose again. And what does Jesus do? Without any prompting, without any words, he says, come on then. Do you want to see the scars in my hands? Do you want to put your hand in my side so that you can believe? Now this must have rocked Thomas's world and everyone else's in the room. We don't get the impression that in the in-between time anyone had seen Jesus over the course of that week. We don't get the impression that any of the disciples have had a conversation with Jesus. But Jesus had heard, firstly, Thomas's doubting spirit, even though Jesus wasn't there. And Jesus had heard the words that had fallen forth out of Thomas's mouth to the other disciples, even when he wasn't in the room. Thomas sees and he hears. He hears that Christ knows him, that Christ has been with him through the past week, that Christ has heard the words that he has spoken, has felt and known the doubts that Thomas has within his head. And we're not told that Thomas gets his finger in there, in his side or anything like that, even though artists throughout the century have wanted to make the most graphic pictures as possible of Thomas having a little poke around. No, there's, there's no indication that Thomas needed to touch without doing anything. Just hearing that Jesus had heard what he had said and seeing him in the flesh before him, what comes out of Thomas's mouth but, my Lord and my God. Thomas becomes the first person within John's gospel to proclaim that Jesus is God. Here we come to the crescendo of John's gospel. John's gospel starts by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Right from the start, John has been telling us that Jesus himself is God and then it is the one who doubted his resurrection who comes forward and proclaims the words that actually puts the full stop on the whole gospel, my Lord and my God. Rather than doubting Thomas, we should call him Thomas the proclaimer of Christ's divinity. Thomas, the proclaimer of Christ's divinity because of his doubts and then the fact that he sees Christ in the flesh and knows that Christ has known his thoughts and his words whilst not being physically there. He recognises and proclaims to the world and down through the centuries that Jesus Christ is Lord and God, just as John proclaimed in the opening words of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God, my Lord, my God, proclaims Thomas. My Lord and my God. The next verse some see as a rebuke of Thomas. If it is, it's the lightest rebuke I have ever seen. But what Jesus then does is he bestows blessing. He gives a beatitude. Blessed are those who believe who have not seen me. And do you know what Jesus does in that second? Do you know what John does as he places it in his gospel? He speaks blessing over those who are reading and have through reading believed that Jesus is God. And Jesus' words of blessing pour out over you and me. Because although we have not seen him, we have believed. That Jesus is the Lord. And that Jesus is God.
This morning, I pray that by the Spirit of God, you would not doubt. But even though you have not seen him, you would proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. That you would repent of your sins, turn from your former life and walk in Jesus Christ's ways. That you would rest upon his grace, knowing that you're going to mess up but endeavour to live up to the sacrifice that Christ made for you on the cross and embrace the freedom he brought to you through his resurrection. May each of us turn our doubts into proclamation. All of us carry with us doubts. But when we have our doubts, we must come back to Jesus and proclaim, because in proclaiming, our doubts disappear. Jesus, my Lord and my God. Say that, say that where you sat at home. Close your eyes. Recognize that Jesus has heard every thought, every word, he's seen every action, even though he hasn't been physically present. And he can repeat them back to you. And in your spirit and mind, say these words, Jesus, my Lord and my God. Then, as we leave this time together, don't call him Doubting Thomas. Remember, he is Thomas the proclaimer of Christ's divinity. Our doubts aren't what define us. Our belief is what defines us as followers of Jesus. Amen. In 1 Peter 8 through to 9, it says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and do not see me. No Jesus benediction over you today. Let's sing together. My Jesus, my Saviour, there is none like him. My Jesus, my Saviour, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your Tower of refuge and strength Let every breath All that I am Never cease to worship you Shout to the Lord all the earth Let us sing Power and majesty Praise to the King Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in Jesus, 
riches of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see Power and majesty, praise to the King Mountains bow down and the seas will roar Then the sound of your name I sing for joy at the work of your Dear Lord, thank you that we're continuing to make um, really good progress uh, with the COVID vaccines and thank you for the advantages it's giving us in the fight against COVID. Um, we really thank you that this gives us the opportunity to begin to meet up with um, friends and with family. Um, but at the same time, Lord, we acknowledge that this can bring some anxiety um, for some people. So we pray for them, Lord, we lift them up and we ask that you grant them your peace as these restrictions um, begin to relax. Um, and we also pray that as we get these freedoms that we'll be responsible um, and we'll uh, be sensible about them and that we will continue to see this improving position uh, as the deaths and the number of infections come down, Lord. And we pray that this good progress will continue. We pray for world leaders at this difficult time as well. Uh, we pray that you will give them clarity and strong leadership that's really needed through the difficult decisions that they have to make. We also pray for other areas of Europe where there are rising cases and rising infections. Uh, we pray that in those places you would bring peace and hope to the people there. We pray also for the riots that we've seen in Belfast in recent days. We pray that there would be a stop to the violence um, and that you would bring peace to everyone involved in those situations. We'd also like to pray for those in our own congregation um, who may be struggling or grieving at this time, Lord. Um, you know who they are and we pray that you'll hold them tight and um, bring your peace to them, Lord. We thank you that through everything you promise to be with us um, and that we know we can trust in you even when it's hard. Amen. Amen. Loving Father God, today we place into your hands Queen Elizabeth and the royal family as they come to terms with the death of Prince Philip. We thank you for Prince Philip's life and his example of loyal service. 
And Lord, we ask that you would be present with all in the royal family as they come to terms with their loss and grief. Be with us as a nation as we mourn. And may we know your love, care and peace abound at this time. We particularly ask your blessing upon Her Majesty as she faces the rest of her reign without her husband by her side. May she know you as her empowerer, her protector and her companion. We ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's In Touch and thank you for everyone who was involved in putting it together or recording something for it. Until I see you again, I'll miss you, but God will be with you. I love you, but he loves you more. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
It's so good as we come today to remember God's faithfulness, to remember his kindness, his goodness, that he is the same God yesterday, that he is the same God today and he is tomorrow. That we can trust him because he is faithful yesterday, so he will be faithful today and will be faithful tomorrow. And the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And they are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness.
singing, great are you, Lord. All the earth, cause all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord. All the earth, and all the earth will shout.
praise you. that we come to a God who is so great and mighty, who's all-knowing, who's all-seeing, who's all-loving, who's ever-present, who's ever-near. I thank you, you don't run out of resources, you never run dry, the well is always full with you. We can always come and drink from you, we can always come and, and find you and you know that you are near. We thank you, God. His grace as our burdens grow greater. He sends us more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, He offers more mercy. To multiply trials, He multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed and the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our earthly resources, the Father's forgiven is only begun. The Father's forgiven is only begun. So His power has no boundary that's known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. So
Just remember God's faithfulness in your life today. Maybe there's something you need to say thank you for. Maybe you need the Holy Spirit to remind you of God's faithfulness today. That's okay. Let's just pause and think and remember.